Welcome to a very brief introduction to Thomas Aquinas' views on happiness. This is Dr. Catherine Abernathy, and we will consider today Aquinas' answer to the question, what makes man ultimately happy? Aquinas is a 13th century theologian and philosopher who was highly influenced by the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. In Aquinas' writing, Aristotle is called simply the philosopher. If you run across the philosopher and philosopher has a capital P, that means Aristotle. According to Aristotle, man by nature desires to be happy, but the goal is not a transitory happiness. Instead, we seek a lasting happiness built on the virtue of the good man. It's a happiness that is least able to be taken away and a happiness that lasts the longest in time. In our selection, Aquinas goes through a list of things that do not give us ultimate happiness and he explains why they don't. He then concludes with what should make us most happy. We are considering only a few chapters from the Summa Contra Gentiles, beginning with chapter 27. In our text, it's on page 231. But before we begin discussing those chapters, let's consider a few definitions that might help make the reading easier. First, when Aquinas refers to the end, he means a telos, meaning a goal or a purpose the thing for which we take action. Second, operation appears several times, and when he's talking about an operation, he just means an action. So we do actions in order to achieve a goal, or we do operations in order to achieve an end. It means the same thing. Also, happiness, as we said before, is an ultimate purpose or an end. It is the longest lasting, most perfect happiness that all people are trying to achieve. Finally, we will come across the word carnal and this relates to the body. We'll start with carnal pleasures. Aquinas argues that carnal pleasures will not bring ultimate happiness to mankind. He says, these are pleasures that are shared with animals, and so they're not the pleasures that achieve for us the highest happiness because we are above animals. And so to seek a pleasure that is an animal pleasure does not benefit us. It benefits the body, but it does not benefit the intellect, which is the highest part of the human being. Further, he explains that carnal pleasures can be pursued in excess and to do that can harm the individual rather than bring happiness. For instance, as in the picture below, if we eat too much it might make us sick or ultimately harm the body. So excesses in carnal pleasures can harm us and therefore they, can't, they cannot be the ultimate happiness because the ultimate happiness should be the longest lasting happiness and we can't just eat forever or it will bring us harm. Next, he says, honors and glory are not going to bring us ultimate happiness. He said that honor or glory depends on others. It dep they both depend on the opinions of others. These opinions can be wrong. People can praise us when we do not deserve it, or people can forget to praise us when we do deserve it. Even bad people can receive honor, and so that doesn't bring the greatest happiness. Glory is not stable. Honor is not stable. We can lose it. People could celebrate us in the morning and then we make a mistake and they no longer celebrate us in the afternoon. So it is not going to bring the longest lasting happiness. Next, he talks about riches and wealth. So many people today pursue riches and wealth, thinking that will bring security and pleasure, but it does not produce the greatest happiness. Riches and wealth are pursued for the sake of another good. Just having a big pile of money won't make us happy because we use the wealth to buy something else. You do not achieve the greatest happiness by pursuing riches and wealth because they are used to get another happiness. The ultimate happiness would be gained through pursuing something that is the 
end or goal in itself. The main benefit, as I said, is in the wealth being spent, so it is not the ultimate happiness. Also, wealth, like honor and glory, can be lost, so it's not the longest lasting happiness. Finally, some might say, oh, we're going to pursue the arts. It makes me happy to paint. It makes me happy to sing. Or other arts, like making plates and dishes. Well, <laughs> um, although these things can be pleasurable activities, still those arts are not pursued for the goal of happiness in itself. Usually those arts, especially the arts of say carpentry or dish making uh, or even shoe making or car building, these are arts. Uh, all of these are arts in the, the way that Aquinas is using the term. And these arts are pursued to make things for our use. They are not so much done in order to make us happy. Further, because they are directed to another end, they are not uh, pursued in order to make us happy. Also, these are fleeting, uh, fleeting pursuits. You have to have other things in order to practice the arts. You can't just practice the arts without the equipment. Say, if you are a carpenter or a car maker, you have to have equipment, equipment that can go away. So, the arts are also not going to allow us to achieve happiness that is an ultimate lasting happiness. Ultimate happiness instead, Aquinas says, comes from the contemplation of God because it is something pursued for its own sake. We would contemplate God specifically in order to contemplate God and enjoy doing so. Uh, we don't contemplate God to make money. We don't contemplate God in order to have a roof over our heads. We don't contemplate God for another end. It is its own end. It also unites man to a higher being as opposed to the carnal pleasures that we began with. This unites man to a being higher than himself rather than uh, being a, a pleasure that we pursue that sort of links us or refers us to lower beings, the animals. Instead, this calls man to something higher. It is also a self-sufficient action. We do not need money to think about God. We do not need um, food to think about God. We don't need things that will go away, uh, things that will run out of, like wealth, in order to pursue God or to contemplate God. It is the most self-sufficient action. This is not to say that things like a comfortable room or the absence of hunger won't help, but for the most part, it is a self-sufficient action. We can contemplate God wherever we are and in whatever situation we find ourselves. Also, to contemplate God is something that is achieved with virtue. Uh, it helps to be a virtuous person. Uh, it, it helps to be pursuing virtue as we contemplate God because it makes us able to, um, to achieve or attain to being closer to being godlike. It unites, us to, it unites us to the higher being who is God. So pursuing virtue helps us to attain to what God is um, and so it makes us happiest. Because it is longest lasting, we can contemplate God for the longest time. We don't have to worry about running out of God. He is always there. And he is the best being. He is all perfect. Then it is the thing, the, it is the action uh, or um, the practice which will make us happiest for the longest amount of time. You might consider then, how is it that Raskolnikov would pursue this kind of happiness? How is it that he would perceive this kind of happiness? He seems concerned, at least in the first part, first part of Crime and Punishment, uh, to be concerned more with wealth rather than goodness. And how can you, how can you see a similarity or a difference in what Aquinas thinks and in what Raskolnikov thinks at the beginning of the book, and then consider how he might respond toward the end of the novel.